So we're in week four, the final week of our series called the prequel to the Sermon on the Mount. I always smile when I say prequel, it kind of reminds me of Star Wars. But um, it was a prequel because we needed to get our thinking straight before we could understand and embrace and respond to Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. And we want to get our thinking straight about God, what we think when we think about God, what we did in week one and two in the series. Then last week, what we looked at was to get our thinking straight about ourselves, because there's a, as we saw, there's a connection between knowledge of self and knowledge of God, as um, John Calvin said. So, And this week, I just want to get uh, address the topic, what is the good life, and get our thinking straight on what is the good life. Because again, we have to get our thinking straight about these things, because as we connect with God, we will only be able to connect with Him if we think correctly and accurately about Him. So, in uh, John 10, 9, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full or have it abundantly. That's kind of our scripture for, for today. So the question is, what is the good life? And the world can tell you what the good, good life is. Do you know anyone who's living the good life? Like, none of us might never really thought about how to define the good life. But we, we all have kind of an idea of what the good life for us would look like. And the world is really clear about it. Like, and so it's kind of like the good life would be some degree of financial security and comfort. Like not extreme wealth, but comfortable. That's definitely part of the good life. Being able to retire at 60, like retire a little bit early and retire with a degree of comfort, that might be regarded as part of the good life. Owning your own home, that's definitely part of the good life. Being in good health, having a life partner and children that you love and they love you, and then that your children do well. And that's kind of a picture of the good life. Really, for most people, the good life is what you might call a nice life. And in this sermon, I'm going to use that term, a nice life, to describe this image of the good life. And just to continue with that image, like for most people, whether you're Christian or not, the nice life would also include being a reasonably nice person, you know, like a good neighbor, supporting good causes, helping out at the local GAA club, and it's just stuff like that. And then for Christians, we would have the added thing about uh, it would because it would also include faith in Jesus, being involved in church, serving in some way, trying to be a better person. So the good life defined as the nice life. But the Bible has a version of the good life, and it's really what Jesus says, life to the full or life abundantly. And I'm going to use, for that version of the good life, I'm going to use the phrase life to the full or life abundantly so that we can keep them separate. And when you think about that life, that good life, when you think about life to the full or life abundantly, what do you think about when you think about that life? What do you imagine it to be? Now, like the nice life, the life to the full that Jesus offers, it might be that none of us ever sat down to define it. But we all do have kind of an idea of what it might look like. Obviously, like the life to the full, peace, joy, kindness. But life to the full is a little bit more tricky for us because we kind of know the right answer we think and we're kind of a little bit afraid of the right answer because in the back of our minds we're a little bit afraid of what we might have to give up what jesus might ask us to do in this life to the full so it's worth asking like the nice life as opposed to life to the full which is the good life which one are you pursuing? Can you have both? Is the life Jesus is offering really good? These are really helpful questions to, to help us think about these things because we want to think deeply about them. So let me give you two stories. Remember, we're talking about life to the full as the good life. 
David Watson was a church leader in England in the 70s and 80s. He was regarded as the most influential leader in the Anglican Church. Another church leader at the time said of David Watson, it is doubtful whether any other English Christian leader has had greater influence on this side of the Atlantic since the Second World War. He was actually responsible for bringing John Wimber and the Vineyard over to the UK. He had a family, a nice home, a very successful ministry, really the good life. Then at 50, he was diagnosed with cancer and lots of people prayed for him for healing, including John Wimber. There were many words that God would heal him. But 13 months after the diagnosis, David died on February the 18th, 1984. And right before he died, he wrote a book called Fear No Evil, his account of what he was learning through this journey with God in cancer. And I just want to read one or two of the things that he said. The most important lesson I've learned these last 11 months is that God loves me, is always with me, in the dark as in the light, and that I cannot trust him too much. I remember he died February the 18th. On January the 8th, just a few weeks before that, he said the last couple of months have seen some pretty sweeping changes in my own life and it was very painful and what he was going through. I would have found that very difficult had it not been for God so clearly calling me back to this love relationship with him. Even death itself is not a threat. January 15th, he preached from Psalm 91, his last sermon. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And he said he found that highly relevant to his life. On Monday the 30th, a little more than two weeks before he died, he told a friend, I am completely at peace. He died on February the 18th. Let me ask you a question. Remember we're talking about life to the full. Does that sound like someone who, in the valley of the shadow of death, fears no evil because God is with them? Actually, let me go even a step further than that. Does that sound like someone who's experienced goodness and mercy following him all the days of his life, even in this journey with cancer? Was he experiencing life to the full there? Another story. Many of us have read the account of Corey Ten Boom and Betsy Ten Boom. And can I just encourage you, David's book, Fear No Evil, Corey's book, uh, The Hiding Place, just they're great to help us get a glimpse of how God works in our lives. I just encourage you to read biographies. But they were in a concentration camp in World War II, and what they suffered physically, mentally, the lack of food, the lack of clothing, the brutal guards, it was horrific. And Betsy didn't survive the camp. But the whole time she's there, as you're reading about her and what she's saying and how she's interacting with people, she's just filled with life in this place of death. As you read it, you get this picture of someone, their cup is overflowing in a concentration camp. They have a banquet prepared for them in the midst of their enemies. Their life is in the care of some shepherd that she doesn't want for anything. That sounds really, really extreme, at least it does to me. But when you read it, that's what you're reading. That was her experience. And then just before, the day before she died, she whispered to her sister. She said, we must tell people what we have learned here. We must tell them there is no pit, that he is not deeper still. Jesus had become their shelter, their hiding place, their joy, their peace, their power, their strength. Interestingly, in Betsy, and David, there's no talk of cost, of having to give up something to follow Jesus. It's as if they've found something that is more valuable than whatever else is in their lives, even more valuable than life. It's as if they found a treasure, but it's a living treasure, one that is continually giving them life in all its newness, in all its fullness. This is life to the full. This is the good life. 
that Jesus offers and is really beyond human explanation. It is really a new way of being human. And that's what Jesus is inviting us into. Is that what we think when we think about this newness of life that Jesus is inviting us into, this life to the full? And you won't get there by your own efforts, trying to be good, trying to be joyful. You see, the content of the nice life, remember we talked about what the world says is a good life, the content of a nice life really is determined by the circumstances of your life. Nice circumstances, nice life. Difficult circumstances, not a nice life. So the content of a nice life is circumstances. What's the content of the abundant life that Jesus gives? The content of the abundant life that Jesus gives is Jesus himself. Paul writes to the Colossians, he says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Elsewhere he says to the Colossians, he says, Christ who is your life. To the Philippians, he says, I consider everything rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. To the Galatians, he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 149 times in the letters, it's either in Christ, through Christ, of Christ. The last words of Matthew's Gospel is Jesus speaking to his followers. And he says, surely I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. And Jesus is saying, that's enough. This Jesus must be something else. The life he has must be something else. Something lived out in this world, but not of this world. That's what is being offered. Another way of understanding this life to the full, what Jesus offers, is what Dallas Willard calls the with God life. Living our life with him, moment by moment, day by day. So Jesus really must be something else. And that makes sense when we think about who he really is. When we looked, remember in the first sermon and the second sermon in this series, just a, a being of infinite power, infinite love, bounding in joy, continually present, continually caring for us. And he shares his life with us. He invites us into that kind of life. And that's what's in view in his kind of prayer conversation with his father in John 17, in the first few verses. And he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to those you've given him. That he would give eternal life to those you had given him. What do you think when you think about eternal life? Like we who have faith in Jesus, we, all, we include ourselves in that, that he has given us eternal life. But if you understand eternal life to mean just a long life going on forever, you're missing what Jesus is saying. You see, eternal life isn't just about a long life. It's about a kind of life. He is giving us his kind of life forever. It's knowing the Father and Son and sharing their life together joy-filled, love-soaked, creative, generous. Jesus is inviting you into that kind of life. Not simply to forgive your sins, which he does, or to make sure you're going to heaven, which he does, but to share with him that kind of joy-filled, love-soaked life. But we don't enter it automatically or by accident, or by trying really hard, like I said, to be loving and joyful and kind and generous. We actually get infected with it. And the way we get infected with it, as C.S. Lewis says, is by being exposed to Jesus again and again and again. Remember 149 times uh, the letters say, in Christ, of Christ, with Christ, by Christ. It's all about Jesus. We learn to walk in that kind of good life, a life to the full as we are with Jesus, learning to be like Jesus. Everything God offers revolves around Jesus. Everything comes to us through Jesus. We simply must be with him day by day, 
day in, day out, bringing him into our awareness, thinking of him often through the day, being with Jesus, learning to be like Jesus. Now, next week, we start the series, The Sermon on the Mount, A New Way of Being Human. This series has been a prequel, and it's been directed at your thinking. What you think when you think about God. What you think when you think about uh, yourself. What you think when you think about the good life. Because we can have wrong ideas about all those things. And what I've tried to do is paint a picture of the God who is. Paint a picture of who God made us to be. Paint a picture of the good life. And I've hoped to prod us towards thinking what we really think about those things. And at the same time, paint a picture of, of what they are actually like. So we'll start the Sermon on the Mount next week. And what I'd like to do is end this prequel series with a prayer. And it's Dallas Willard's prayer that he uh, penned in the book, uh, A Life Without Lack. And what we'll do is I'll, I'll read the prayer. And just as I read it, you just sit there quietly with your eyes closed, your hands open if you feel comfortable. And we'll even wait just a, a few seconds afterwards in silence after I finish. Because he is here with us. He wants to minister to us. So this is the prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we are so thankful you said, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We are so thankful for the ease with which you walked upon the earth, the generosity and kindness you show to people, the devotion with which you cared for those who were out of the way and in trouble, the extent to which you loved, you even loved your enemies and lay down your life for them. Jesus, we believe this is a life for us, a life without lack, the sufficiency of your Father, the fullness of life poured through you to us. You've promised to give us that same love, that same life, that same joy, that same power. Lord, slip up on us today. Get past our defenses, our worries, our concerns. Gently open our souls and speak your word into us. We believe you want to do it and we wait for you to do it now. In your name, Lord Jesus, our Emmanuel. Amen.